So one of the next things that we're going to look for is signs of left ventricular failure and recognizing this in the less common or the atypical patients can help us avoid diagnostic error, find these things sooner, and tailor our therapy for patients that need it. As we've talked about previously, recognizing normal left ventricular function, structure, relative chamber sizes, and having that burned in our brain is going to help us recognize abnormal when it happens and it'll stand out for us. So things to look at, so here's a nice parasternal long axis view, you want to start practicing and training your eyes to recognize the thickening of the walls. That's the contraction is how the walls thicken and how much the volume changes during systole or just the volume change throughout the cardiac cycle. And then the mitral valve gives you a lot of clues. So when there's lots of fluid transfer, that causes the mitral valve to open up nice and wide. And you can see during early filling, it pretty much slaps up against the septum. If you see that mitral valve opening nice and widely, slapping up against the septum, they probably have normal left ventricular systolic function. You still want to correlate and look at the rest of the picture, but that's a pretty good indicator of normal function. And just other relative things, we see that the right ventricle, the aortic root, and the left atrium, they look about to be equal thirds. We don't see any pericardial fluid or anything else going on in this picture. So what's the ventricle size shape? What's the squeeze quality? What's the volume change? How well is the mitral valve opening? That's a nice big clue. How close are the endocardial borders coming together during systole? And then what's just the change in volume? And and your eyeballs really need lots of practice and reps to get used to this. So this is one reason to do lots of echocardiograms on normal patients so that you start picking up normal and recognize it easily. So here are some examples where the left ventricle is performing poorly. And I want to point out probably the easiest and quickest thing to recognize is the mitral valve is just not opening very widely because there's not much fluid transfer because the ejection fraction is in the toilet. But we can also see that the volume doesn't really change much throughout the cardiac cycle in these views and so these are left ventricles that are just performing poorly. I'll also point out that it's really important when we're trying to estimate ejection fraction or systolic function we do our best to see those endocardial borders. If we can't see the endocardial borders reasonably well then our estimates of ejection fraction are going to be decreased. Mitral valve can give us clues and just the diameter of the left ventricle can be a clue as well. Those are parasternal long axis views of left ventricular failure. Here are some short axis views that again we can see the endocardial borders pretty well and we can see there's really just not much volume changing there's not much thickening going on similar thing here the volume is not changing much we do have some regional wall motion abnormalities here because we have pretty good thickening up here in this anterior septal wall but this posterior lateral wall just really isn't doing much at all but the volume is not changing these are people with failing left ventricles other examples from a subcostal view or from apical four chamber view where we just don't see a lot of volume change and we have dilated left ventricular chambers in cases of left ventricular failure. Those things that we showed you, those were cases of pump failure and poor function, and that's the most common thing that we're going to see, but there are a few other things to look at. Like previous, these are just further examples of dilated cardiomyopathies. These are more common than you think. Sometimes they happen in younger people without previous heart disease. We want to recognize these and hopefully not miss them. Every other month, I see one of these people who's been on you know, Z-Pax and Albuterol for their shortness of breath, when in reality, what their problem was, they had a cardiomyopathy going on. Nice thing about this, you don't need any calipers or measurements, Doppler. Your eyeballs with a little practice are sufficient to make this diagnosis. Now here are different examples where we see hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, where the walls are just too thick. You can see it's collapsing that chamber here, super thick walls. And again, no calipers, no Doppler needed. With a little bit of training of your eyeballs, you can make these diagnoses quickly. And seeing these things may drastically change your plan, depending on what's going on with the patient, if this wasn't known previously. One other finding that I want to point out here in this example with this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we can see the descending thoracic aorta here. We see this fluid collection that drops down beside and behind the descending aorta. So this is not pericardial fluid, this is pleural fluid. But you can see how without practice, this might fool you for pericardial effusion. So just one thing I want to caution you about, if you have a patient who's maybe in shock or something else, or they're short of breath, and you see a terrible failing left ventricle, you still have to be a clinician, you have to be smarter than the ultrasound screen itself and recognize you know, patients have chronic left ventricular failure. They can still be having other things like COPD or pneumonia, or if they're in shock, they could still be having shock from a GI bleed or something else. So we want this information. We want to find this information. We want to get it, but we have to be clinicians and use it and incorporate it with the entire clinical picture. Don't turn off your brain when you're looking at the ultrasound screen. Look at the ultrasound screen, put that information in your brain and be a doctor about it.
this is a little bit more advanced. I don't want to get too in the weeds about this, but assessing ejection fraction, that's the common thing we want to think about and we talk about. I'll just briefly talk about what these are so you know about them, but we're not going to go into them in detail. Simpson's method, this is what they use beyond their eyeballs, most commonly in the echo lab where they get images in the apical views and essentially calculate the area from diastole to systole and do the math to assess the ejection fraction. The shortening fraction where you just look at the diameter from systole to diastole and you do the math on that, that's another method. And the one that's probably talked about most in the point of care literature is the E-point septal separation. This is really just a maybe more specific or mathematical way to look at how much the mitral valve is opening. So there's some math around that you can do to calculate an ejection fraction if that's important to you. Again, not going to beat it to death at this point. The amount that the aortic root moves during the cardiac cycle has also been looked at. So aortic root displacement has been another thing people have looked at for assessing ejection fraction. It's not perfect. None of these measures are perfect. And then the one that I think is the best with some practice, with some experience, is visual assessment. And there's good literature that shows emergency physicians and point of care users with some practice can make pretty good estimations with their visual assessment of ejection fraction. And that's that's what I think is the best, what I recommend. But I wanted you to know about these other things. So if you're interested, you can look into some more information about those. As we talked about, left ventricular failure comes back to relevance in the case that we went through earlier, our third case. This was our 43-year-old male with cough and increasing shortness of breath, had had multiple visits it's been on Zantac and albuterol and multiple courses of antibiotics for presumed bronchitis. In a few minutes, bedside echocardiogram along with lung ultrasound, which we'll see here and we'll talk more about that later, shows us that the reason this patient's short of breath is they've got a dilated cardiomyopathy later found to be non-ischemic. These are more common than you think, so if someone is short of breath and you're, it's not clear to you or you're not 100% sure, you can drastically decrease your diagnostic error by taking a look at their heart and lungs. I'm just going to mention another thing about risk stratifying patients, so at least in the emergency department, but even in urgent cares and primary care settings, we see people with syncope and chest pain pretty commonly. They're pretty frequent. What I want to talk about is left ventricle function as a risk stratification tool. We all know about risk stratifying with troponin and other risk factors, but there's reasonable evidence that normal left ventricular systolic function, otherwise a grossly structurally normal looking heart, is a favorable predictor in patients with symptoms of syncope, chest pain, palpitations. Not the only risk stratifier, but it can be an additional risk stratifying tool to help you make a little more specific and tailored decisions with these patients. And I will tell you from my practice, most of the time this is a tool that helps me feel more comfortable in managing these people as outpatients who have otherwise pretty low concerning clinical findings and EKG findings. Grossly structurally normal heart, especially left ventricle systolic function, is a prognostically favorable finding and can add comfort level to sending these patients home. Often, I think it also gives patients peace of mind as well. So think about that. It's been a, certainly a positive incorporation into my practice.